one of the things that I miss about Oregon uh, right now it's probably raining I know it rains until like May then we have our two months of summer and then the the winter happens again so but I've actually liked the the rain that we've had recently um, I like to always look back on the 90s because for some reason it seems like that's when I was the happiest because when you're a kid you don't really have a lot of worries and so I always think about well I remember when I was a kid the only thing I really cared about back then was you know hanging out with friends and doing stuff and you know I didn't have to worry about like paying rent getting a job um, really the biggest responsibility on my plate was just finishing homework um, being raised in an Asian family, make sure I had my A's, you know, A minus, no, got to get an A, you know, and that's really the only worry I had growing up. And so I look back in the 90s and I remember there's certain fads or trends that were really great back then and now it's just like, eh, whatever. Um, I remember in the early 90s, Pogs. I don't know if any of you remember Pogs. Um, it's a little game, um, it's like, uh, milk caps, but they're, they're like the uh, the paper milk caps, and then you would have a, a thicker pog, which is like a slammer, and what you do is you stack um, the pogs together, and you take your slammer and you hit it, and you try to flip them over, and if you flip them over, and you play with two or three other friends, and you flip them over, you get to keep those pogs. So it's a it's a little bit of a game. It's also like a collectible thing, where if you win it, you get to keep other people's um, pogs. And the slammers got really ridiculous because they would be thicker and weighted. That way there was enough force when you slam it down on the stack, it would flip the pogs over. Um, and, and they got ridiculous in the sense that some of them were really thick, like, you know, two, three inches. They're made out of metal. So it's like you're throwing a rock down instead of a small pog. I remember when I was a kid, I did that and it was amazing and it lasted like three months. <laughs> that fad just came and went. Um, another fad that I remember from the late 90s is, um, it's, it's a long word, audio stereograms. And, or commonly known as magic eye. And I think I have an example that we can show up on the screen. If you see it, I think you'd re remember what it is. And actually, you might still see it around now. But back in the 90s, it was very common. Um, while we get that going. It was very common because anywhere you went, like a shopping center or a mall, there'd be like a kiosk selling these things. Um, yeah, these things. Magic Eye. And some of them would be framed and people would be like, oh wow, that's interesting. And the whole idea is there's supposed to be an image, a different picture beyond what you see here. Uh, the idea is that there is a 3D image that if you somehow relax your eyes, defocus your eyes on the image you see, there's supposed to be something else back there. I had such a hard time. I still can't figure it out. Do you guys see anything there besides just... Yeah. Apparently the trick is you're supposed to see beyond the image. Because what our eyes do automatically is when they see something, it focuses. And it's something that like, you don't do purposely. It just, it's automatic. Your brain knows what you're seeing. And so when you see an object in front of you, it focuses. So it understands the depth, how far it is from your eyes, and also the angle, because you have two eyes, and they come from a different angle. And so how to focus and point those pupils of yours to one spot on the object. Now, what you're supposed to do on this is not look at the screen, but you're supposed to look beyond the screen and somehow not look at the screen, yet when you do that, an image appears. So, let's go to the next slide. It'll show you what this image actually is. It was an eagle. Oh, I saw it. <laughs> yeah, not, oh, yeah, it was there, right? Let's go to the next one. I got another one. I got another one. That was a little dark, but it's not an eagle. It's something else. So, so try to f relax your eyes. And beyond the screen, you know there's a, the baptismal. And there's a cross. Just focus on the cross. Kind of like that. Focus on the cross. Don't focus 
on the screen. Focus on the cross. See if you can see something. Somehow, maybe you see the image that's beyond there. I'll give you five more seconds. I've tried. I, I still can't see it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I'll show you what it is. It was a horse. <laughs> They're like, what am I supposed to be looking at? Let's do one more. Let's do one more. Yeah, your eyes do hurt after a while. Like, uh, this is taking too much energy. All right, let's, let's see what this image really is. It's a shark. Did anyone see that? Did anyone get one right? <laughs> yeah. The, no. I remember as a kid, I was frustrated because everyone else around me was like, oh, I see it, I see it. I'm like, are they lying to me? Or do they actually see it? And I'm not able to see it. It frustrated me. Why can't I do this? And I, I look upon today's church in America, and I, I've been thinking about what church is lately a lot, just because if, for those who know my story, right now I'm in the midst of planning a church plant. And so this idea of church, what it is about, what does it look like, especially here in America, in Southern California, in our community, you know, it's, it's been on my mind. And what I've noticed is that the church in America, in the 21st century right now, is just like these magic eye pictures. You can't see it. You know it's there. People say it's there. But we're not able to perceive it. And I feel that it was never like that before. When I think about the 90s in my time, there's also an era before that that I loved that I didn't live through, but just reading about it, watching TV shows, even listening to people who lived through it, the 50s and the 60s. The late 50s or early 60s. I like that era. It's kind of like that classic Americana. Um, Josie actually commented on my tie this morning, like the skinny tie. I love this fashion. There's something about that era that was, it's just, it was simple, it seems like. Mind you, I, I didn't live through that time, but it, that's what it feels like from what I've read and what I've heard from others. And back then, the church was the center of life in the community. And what I've heard is that on Sundays, it was very common for the town to shut down, no businesses open, because everyone went to church. And in fact, some states, some counties had rules against this, of being open. I think they were called blue laws, that it was actually illegal to be open on Sunday. They were trying to promote the church. Hey, we shouldn't be doing, uh, doing anything on Sundays. We should be gathering together as a community at our local church. And you go to, like, say, a downtown of a small town, and you see several churches in a few blocks. You have a First Baptist here, and a First Methodist here, and a First, First Presbyterian there. And, and just imagining what it was to just on a Sunday in the late 50s and the early 60s. Wake up, and you wear your Sunday best. I, I like the other aspect of being relaxed and not caring what you wear because God doesn't really care about what you're wearing as long as your heart is there. I understand that. But I also respect back then when they decided, what is my best outfit? Because I'm taking that before God. And that's what they did. They wore their Sunday best. You see pictures from that era where little kids are going to Sunday school and they have ties on. They go to church in the morning and in the afternoon they would have people over at their family. Families or people over at their house 
have a barbecue, go for a Sunday drive, and then they would go back to church that night. A simple time. During the late 50s and the early 60s, church membership in America was growing at a faster rate than the population. 50% of the U.S. population in 1950 were church members. Not that they just went to church, but they had membership at a church. And by 1960, it was 63.3%. Almost two-thirds of the country belonged to a church. And now let's fast forward to the teens. Is that what we call it now? 21st century. Research done by Thomas Rayner and Ed Stetzer, they write about the church. They do research, they do surveys, and they said that nine out of ten churches today are on the decline. Nine out of ten. Which blows my mind because the luxury I've had recently is on Sundays I go to different churches in the area because I want to see how church is done. It gives me a perspective and an idea of how we're going to form our church plant. And what I've noticed to these churches that I've gone to is they're vibrant, they're growing. I've been to about 10 of those in the last two, three months. And what blows my mind is if I saw 10 that were growing and strong and healthy, there's another 90 that's not. And that's the reality we're living in right now. What has happened to the church? It's not like this everywhere. Actually, the areas where the church is growing at an exponential rate are third world countries. In Africa, it's just growing like crazy. In Latin America, in China. China's not a third world country, but because of the political system there, it's growing. But it's not growing here in America. And it's actually the reverse, it's declining. The church has seemed to lost its way here in America. What has happened? I have a quote from Woodrow Wilson. Let me show up. A nation which does not remember what it was yesterday does not know what it is today, nor what it is trying to do. We are trying to do a futile thing if we do not know where we came from or what we have been about. Uh, as I read this quote, I'm like, President Wilson made a really good point. Where we are right now as a church, not just the local church here in Hacienda, but the bigger church in America, how do we fix this? Where were we before is what we need to focus on. Not necessarily what it was in the 50s or 60s, but what it was in the Bible. What did the church do in the first century? What did the disciples to do once Jesus left and they had this monumental task of building the church? So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 37, but I'm going to summarize verses 1 to 36. This is right after Easter, which is interesting because we're going towards Easter, but I really wanted to share this message. The setting is after Easter, Jesus has risen. For 40 days, he was with his disciples. And Jesus ascended into heaven. And when he left his disciples, he gave them a command, the Great Commission. Make disciples. Pretty much is the summary of that. So now they have this mission, this commandment, this task in front of them, but they don't know what it's going to look like. Jesus just kind of suddenly left. And for about 50 days after that, they were meeting together, I think every day, the disciples and some of the other followers. It's probably about, you know, anywhere between, what, 11 and probably 30 people meeting together on a regular basis for those 50 days, praying and figuring out what are we do going to do? What is the plan? in front of us. And then on the 50th day, we call Pentecost, Penta is 50. The Holy Spirit 
flows down from heaven. And, and the disciples start speaking in tongues. This is a scary thing. If someone is standing next to you and you know, you're having a conversation and then instantly they're speaking in a language you don't understand or even recognize, you think they went crazy. But the disciples and several of the other followers were overwhelmed by the Spirit and they just started speaking in tongues. And it was such a noise that people that were outside of the home that they were meeting in heard. And the people that were in Jerusalem at that time were from all over the world. Jerusalem and Israel, back in the first century, was in a strategic location because of the trade routes going from Asia to Europe to Africa. They were right in the middle of that. So you had people from all over the world. It was a global city for the first century, just like, say, New York is a global city. London is a global city. You have people from all over the world living there. LA is a global city. We have so many different types of people here. Jerusalem was the same thing. You had people from all over the world there. And they heard people speaking in their own language. Like, wait, they're speaking in my language. I've never heard that here in Israel. So they heard this and they wanted to know what it was about. So a bunch of the people right outside the home went inside and are like, what is going on? Are you guys drunk? And Peter's like, no, it's nine in the morning. We're not drunk. Actually, let me tell you what this is about. This is about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came because of a guy that was crucified and risen about two, three months ago. And so chapter two is Peter proclaiming the gospel message. And so in verse 37, we're, we're going to pick up. He's finished with the message. And this is the response we get from the people who heard it. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? So they heard this, and instantly they felt a change. They were pierced to the heart, or um, I think they figuratively say, wounded in conscience. Something happened in their heart where they realized what we just heard is going to change our lives. They understood at the moment that what they did, not necessarily like physically did with their hands to Jesus, but as human beings, we sent a man who was blameless to death. And at that moment, they realized their guilt. They were brokenhearted. They were convicted, and they wanted to know, what shall we do? There's a lot of times when we see a movie or read a book or hear someone talk, and they say something or we read something, and it changes your mind instantly. Or maybe not even changing your mind, but you feel something. And it was that moment where you realized something's going to be different here. When 9-11 happened, I was 19 years old. I remember that morning. I woke up. I was in college at Azusa Pacific. I woke up and I worked in the mailroom, uh, a student campus job. And I went to work at like 7.30 in the morning. And I remember we got there, I got there, and my boss and a couple of the other kids that were already there, they were kind of somber. I didn't really know what was going on. I was just trying to wake up because that was early for me. And I just asked, hey, what's going on? Well, it feels a little down today. And they're like, well, something's happening. We don't know what's going on, but something's happening in New York. And as we went through that day and figured out what was happening, I remember coming home after work and a day full of classes, because that happened in the morning. And then about 5, 6 o'clock, I came home to our apartment. Vin and I were living together. And we turned on the TV, and we just watched the news for the next, like, three straight weeks. Trying to consume what just happened. Trying to understand. And at that moment, I remember being fearful. Is this the world we're living in now? 
what is going to happen. Mind you, I was 19 at that time, and I, my first instance is we're going to war. Is there going to be a draft? Am I going to get drafted? That was my, one of my first uh, reactions to this. This is going to affect us, my generation. And for a couple weeks, that was kind of the, the place I was at. And then at the end of October, when everything was trying to get back to normal, the World Series was happening. And that year, it was the Yankees versus the Diamondbacks. Game three, the game, game one and two was in Arizona. Game three was back in New York. And I remember uh, President Bush was asked to throw out the first pitch. And, you know, presidents have thrown out the first pitches before at a baseball game. No big deal. But because of the context of where we were as a country, this was a huge, huge deal. And I remember watching that game. And I don't like the Yankees. I was rooting for the Diamondbacks. But it was part of me like, you've got to root for New York. I remember President Bush going up there to the mound. And I didn't know this at that time. But later on, they said that um, underneath, when he was practicing, underneath the stadium, he was practicing for the pitch. And Derek Jeter, the Hall of, well, future Hall of Famer for, from the Yankees, went up to the president and says, where are you going to throw the ball from? Because usually if you're throwing out the ceremonial pitch, you're not throwing from the mound. You're going to be up 10 feet closer to the plate so you don't have to throw as far. And he's like, well, I'm probably going to throw about several feet from the mound. And Derek Jeter's like, no, this is New York. You're, they're going to boo you. You better pitch from the mound. Oh, and don't bounce the ball. It better be perfect because they will boo you. This is New York. And another thing was that Bush was wearing a bulletproof jacket. So I, I don't know how heavy a bulletproof jacket is, but it's got to be uncomfortable trying to throw a ball 60 feet 6 inches into a small strike zone with the whole world watching and how important that moment was. And he went up to that mound as everyone was standing up and chance of USA, USA. And he threw a perfect strike. You know, it, it's just a ball game. But for some reason, at that moment, it pierced my heart. And I said, we're going to be all right. Somehow, we're going to get through this. And that was my moment. And that's just kind of the best way I can try to explain what these disciples felt when they preached, when Peter preached to these people, hey, this is who Jesus is. This is what happened two months ago. He died. He rose. He's a living God. He wants to save you from your sin. And when they heard that message, they were pierced to the heart. Instantly they say, what are we supposed to do? Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So the, the standard response to anyone who asks, well, what am I supposed to do to receive Jesus? Well, repent. All the things you're doing wrong, all the things you're doing bad, all the sinful things in your life, you need to get rid of it, turn to God. Be baptized, meaning make a public declaration that you're following God. Let your sins be forgiven. Pretty standard stuff from Peter. And I like what he says next when he says, it's for you, and it's for your children, and it's for anyone who's far off. So it's not just for the disciples who lived with Jesus for two, three years, followed him everywhere, who were eyewitnesses to the things that Jesus was doing. It's not just for them. It's for those that they preached to. It's for you. And guess what? It's for your children because you're going to pass that on to your children. And it's going to be those you, make, um, you come in contact with, those who you've never seen today but you will see tomorrow. 
who are far off, they will also be, this gift of the Spirit will also be available to them. It's, a, it, it's good news. That's what the gospel is. In verse 40, and, men, and with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So when those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So Peter continues and says, Hey, just, you need to get away from the people around you. They're perverse, they're corrupt. They will bring you down. And when they heard all this, they received the word that Peter was speaking. They repented. They were baptized. And Jesus added 3,000. This is the first day in the history of the church. 3,000 were added on the first day. And one thing happened. The gospel was preached. And I think that's one of the biggest things that's happening right now in the American church. I think we have forgotten to proclaim the gospel. There's a pastor uh, of a mega church in, in Texas, Lakewood Church. You might have heard of him. Joel Osteen. I'm, I'm going to say this disclaimer. He's a great man. He's a godly man. I do not doubt what he preaches. I think what he preaches is good. I think people learn from him. He is a great Christian. But, when you actually listen to his sermons, his messages, he doesn't really talk about Jesus a lot. And when I first was reading his book and, and listening to his messages, I saw... I. I you know, I saw that. I'm like, am I just cynical? Am I... I don't know. And then I came across this article. And I'm not the only one who sees this. Um, Tim Shalais, who's an author and a blogger. This is how he um, describes Joe Osteen. He writes, The very first time I saw Joe Osteen on television, he was speaking about the importance of a healthy diet including the rejection of pork, shellfish, and other unhealthy foods. My son, who was probably five or six at the time, listened for a minute and said, that's not the gospel. <laughs> and I learned that day that even a child can unmask his teaching as nothing more than a feel-good brand of self-empowerment. And he goes on to write about his book. And by the way, his book came out about 10 years ago. It was on the New York Times bestseller for two years. It has sold over 4 million copies. It's a good book. It's a good read. But here's the problem with it. He says, Osteen's book was widely criticized by Christian leaders for ignoring the gospel of salvation through Christ's atoning sacrifice in favor of a gospel of financial and life-wide prosperity. While Osteen claimed to be teaching biblical principles, he was instead picking and choosing isolated verses of the Bible to teach self-empowerment, much as Norman Vincent Peale and so many others had done before him. In a helpful, helpful review of the book, Greg Gilbert summarizes it well. Yes, Osteen talks about God throughout, but it is not the God of the Bible he has in mind. Osteen's God is little more than the mechanism that gives the power to positive thinking. There is no cross. There is no sin. There is no redemption or salvation or eternity. If Joel Osteen wants to be the Norman Vincent Peale of the 21st century, he has every right to give it a shot. But he should stop marketing his message as Christianity because it is not. You cannot simply make reference to God, quote some scripture, call what you're saying spiritual principles, and pass it off as Christianity. kind of hits the gut there. And that's kind of how I felt. Like I said, it's a great book to read if you want to empower yourself. But to proclaim it as the gospel message, it is not. And then, when you listen to his messages consistently, there's not a lot of Jesus in it. The church has forgotten to preach the gospel. And this is really, falls more on the leaders of the church 
on the pastors, on the deacons, the elders. That is what Jesus did on the cross being taught. That's really the, the number one thing because on the first day of the history of the church, 3,000 were added and all they did was preach the gospel. But they did other things. Verse 42. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So, hopefully the leaders of the church is preaching the gospel. And here's what the church in general can do now. They were continually devoting themselves. That means there's an active engagement that's sustainable to these four things in that verse. They weren't there to be, to just soak everything in. They weren't consumers. They were devoting themselves. When you devote to something, you have to participate. You have to put in effort. When you're in a marriage, you devote your life to each other. But you can't just say, hey, I'm devoted to you and then not do anything on your part. That's not going to fly. And just like when you're in a church, when you devote yourself, you're giving a part of yourself to the good of the community. So they devoted themselves to teaching of the apostles, what they were telling them at that moment. So they were teaching, and for our part, that's learning. There's an intentional mental development that was happening here. They wanted to seek knowledge. I like that uh, during the morning announcements, uh, Keith came up here and was talking about uh, this new thing that they're doing. Um, going through the, the how to, to present the gospel. This is an opportunity. This is one of those things where, hey, if you have Bible study, you should be involved. This whole thing about participation, I've seen it time and time again where people just go to church on Sunday mornings and that's their whole thing. And they say, I'm a Christian. You might be, but it might be some of the reasons why the church in general is declining because that's all we think church is now, on a Sunday morning. I love the Hacienda gives you other opportunities to engage in your faith. You should take those chances. Take those opportunities. They were devoting themselves to fellowship. The, the Greek word here is koinonia. And koinonia is a packed word. There's so much in it that it's hard to just translate it in English. The, the simple translation is fellowship. But koinonia means more than just fellowship, just hanging out or communion. It means that there's joint participation. Once again, it's an active relationship. Koinonia means everyone brings something to the table. So when they were in fellowship with each other, they were all taking part in the life that the community was living. They didn't just show up on Sunday mornings. They got together and someone would bring this, someone would bring that, someone would pray, someone would preach. Everyone was involved. And that's what real koinonia, real fellowship is about. Because God knows nothing of solitary religion. I know there's some people who have faith, but don't go to church. And I use this example. C.S. Lewis once said that you could take a bunch of coals, put it together in a pile, light it, and it will sustain itself. You take one coal out of that pile, set it aside, it won't. As a Christian, if you take yourself apart from a community of believers, look what's going to happen. Fellowship, koinonia. They are also devoted to the breaking of bread. I love this one. The breaking of bread. I mean, it's debatable if, if Luke, who's writing Acts was mentioning either communion, which we do on, on the first Sundays, 
or if it was just a simple meal. Because the early church, when they gathered together, they had meals together, like full-on meals. Uh, and it really doesn't matter which version you think Luke is trying to write about. I like to prefer the meal. Why? Because usually at a meal, you slow down. You're supposed to slow down. Sit down, eat, talk, relate. Family dinners. I don't know if they exist anymore. Now it's like, oh, I'm going to grab something at Taco Bell. We, we get it. Like, I work right now at a mortgage company, and I literally, every day, it seems like I have my lunch at my desk. Because there's just so much work to do. A working lunch. But back then, when they had a meal, when they were breaking bread, they slowed down what was going on in their lives, sat down, and they ate together. And they probably had some amazing conversations. And the fourth thing, they were devoted to prayer. This one's pretty simple. And I don't really need to talk about it just because this church is a church of prayer. Even when I was here, the amount that people would pray blew my mind. But there's churches out there in America that don't. Preach the gospel. Devote yourself to teaching and learning, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to talking with each other, and to prayer. This is what the first century church did. Remember, they added 3,000 on the first day. I think these are some of the things that the modern church has forgotten to do. In verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. This is just confirmation that the church was active because to see signs and wonders means something was happening. It wasn't just, hey, we showed up on a Sunday. No, they were actively engaged. Verse 44, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. I like to look at this verse, or these couple of verses, and, and kind of idealize the notion of, what if we just all sold our stuff and shared everything? I think that idea would have been great, but let's... Let's take that out of the context of the first century and put it here in America on the 21st. I don't think that would fly. I don't think this is a command either. Hey, you should sell everything that you own, give it to the church, and we're all just going to share. And I think the point that Luke was trying to make here is, hey, no one should be in need. If someone is suffering in your church, you should be helping them out. I think that's the main point here. And I look at churches out there. Some of them have these amazing programs. We have a program for the youth. We have a program for the kids. We have a program for the senior adults. We have this and that. and that. We're doing retreats and mission trips. That's, that's good. But are you taking care of the people in your community? Have we lost focus on the needy? the people that Jesus actually reached out to. No one should be in need. Verse 46, And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they are taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And not only were they doing all things, all these things, they were doing it with joy, with gladness, with thanksgiving, with the sincerity of heart. I grew up in the church. My dad is a Korean pastor. I kind of know what happens behind the scenes. I know there's a lot of politics in church. And because of that, I know people who go to church and they're not happy. There's resentment. 
There's manipulation. There's corruption. There's gossip. The first century went to church happy. Last time I was here, I was telling you my struggles at the DMV. <laughs> and for those who don't remember, I, when I moved down here from Oregon, I was getting my California license. And I thought it was just going to be, oh, I need to go there one day, set up an appointment, or it'd be all taken care of. Went there the first day. They said, do you have your birth certificate or your passport? I'm like, oh, I do. I just didn't bring it. They're like, well, we need some form of ID to know who you are. I'm like, I have my Oregon driver's license. I think you know who I am. They're like, no, it has to be one of these things. We can't process your, your application. We can't even start on it. Oh, fine. Go back two weeks later. Make another appointment. Go back. Have my passport. Here it is. Okay. They go through it. And then they said, hey, your eyes are bad. You're going to have to take a behind-the-wheel test. I'm like, are you serious? Fine. I'll take the behind-the-wheel test. I have over 16 years of driving with nothing on my record. But okay, I will take your behind-the-wheel test had to schedule the earliest possible test available was two months ahead. So for two months, it was a funny thing. They told me, oh, you can still drive with your valid Oregon license. We just can't give you a California one. Okay, so the next two months, I was still able to drive, but I had to wait until that day my appointment came. So I finally, about two, three weeks ago, I took my test, and obviously I passed 100%. I didn't even study for it, you know? I know how to drive. So I get to the DMV. We do the driving test. They give me the license. Oh, they give me the temporary one. I just received it in the mail, like the permanent one, this week. Now, now that ordeal compared to what I did in Oregon. Well, I remember when I was 16, I was getting my Oregon's driver's license. Everything was done for you that day. We didn't need an appointment. We showed up. Hey, I didn't want to apply for a license. Do you have your permit? Yes. Okay, that's good enough for your ID. You fill out the application. You take the test. It took about 10 minutes. Then, okay, we have a behind-the-wheel test. We got an appointment in 15 minutes. Okay, wait 15 minutes. Get on the road. 20 minutes later, you've passed. Then they're like, okay, let's put it into our system. They actually physically made the card there on the spot. And then five minutes, I got my card. Within an hour, I was in and out. So, my first picture here, look at how happy I am. <laughs> now look at the California picture, look at how mad I am. Because when they finally took my picture, after three times, uh, within an hour in Oregon. California, I have to make an appointment, and even when you make an appointment, it's still about a two, three hour ordeal. And I had to do that three separate times. I'm not a happy camper. So when they took my picture, they're like, smile. I'm like, no. <laughs> and here's another thing that bugs me now that I didn't see on my application. Expiration date, 2020. This is a four-year license. My Oregon license was for 10 years. You want me to come back in four years? Hmm. Happy, not happy. <laughs> Some people go to church and they're not happy. The first century church was happy. They had joy, they had gladness. And they also had favor with all the people. I don't know why some churches like to burn bridges with their community. I mean, a prime example is Westbury Baptist Church. It's that church that protests and pickets funerals of veterans and those who've died serving our country. Why would you do that? Why would you not want to be in favor with the people you're trying to reach out to? Now, the first century church did all that and look what happens. The last sentence in verse 47. And the Lord was adding to their number 
day by day those who are being saved. A stark contrast from where the church is today in America. Nine out of ten churches are declining. That's a fact. We have lost our way. What did the church do? Where were we before? And in the first century, the early days of the church, they preached the gospel. They were actively participating in the life of the church, to teaching and learning, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer. They found favor in their community, and they did it all with gladness. It's a challenge for us. You know, and, and there's a lot of things here that I think this church is already doing. But I also know there's a couple areas that this church is also lacking in. And I say this with love. Sometimes we get too caught up on the minor things. I mean, they're important things, like the business side of the church. Like the budget. Or programs or events. Maybe get caught up too much in that. Especially if there's like arguments in the meetings. And we've kind of lost what the primary focus of church is. Or sometimes when there's a difference of theology or how we do ministry, the philosophy of ministry. Oh, worship is too loud. Oh, why can't we sing more hymns? Oh, why aren't we dressed like Victor every Sunday? <laughs> I'm not trying to say we should disregard all that. They're important things. But they shouldn't be a priority over the things that the first century church were doing. We still need to preach the gospel. We still need to be actively participating in our church. If we did that, not just here, but every church, we can reverse this trend. Look what's happening in the third world countries. Look what's happening in Africa, in China, in Latin America. The church is growing at an exponential rate. And look where we're at here. These are the things that I've been thinking about. How are we going to fix this? Everyone has a part. You, me, anyone who says that they follow Christ has a part. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity just to share what's on my heart um, at this time and just hoping that it finds root because it affects all of us. You've called us to be the church, called us to proclaim the message, to go out and make disciples, to baptize them in your name. And Lord, let us not forget that. Let's go back to the primary thing, the primary mission of the church. Those other things that we deal with, Lord, they're important. But let it not get in the way of our central mission. Give us the strength. Give us the courage. Give us the tools to do that. So we can equip the saints for their edification. So Lord, bring this challenge upon every one of us to go out and live this out every week. So we can reverse this trend, Lord, that we want to grow your church, not just worldwide, but here in America, here in Southern California, here in Hase and the Heights. Let your spirit fall on us like it did on Pentecost. Lead us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.